and uh, welcome to Rainy Jachenau. So uh, today I would like to talk with you a little bit about this knife. It's the Pathfinder Scout knife. It's made by Battle Horse Knives based on the design by David Canterbury. I'm going to show you a little bit about uh, the history of this knife, some of the uh, stats and how it works. I want to talk to you a little bit about the steel, but I first want to talk to you about what this knife is actually for. Um, because there are quite a few people who've, who've got this knife and who are using it as a uh, one tool does all uh, option. Um, we need to understand when we're reviewing this knife that that's not actually what it was originally designed to do. It's based on a frontier knife shape and the shape and the geometry of the knife tells you pretty much everything about how it's going to function. So let's look at this knife and its shape in some more detail. For that we're going to have to go inside. So some stats about this blade, it's uh, got 27 centimeters uh, total length, the blade length is 14 centimeters. Um, it weighs about 280 grams, uh, which compares about, makes it about the same weight as a, uh, as a military kabar or um, a loiku. Most hunting knives are in the 200 range and a mora uh, black, which is a heavy duty mora, is about 113 grams. The uh, width of the blade is about 3 millimeter, uh, which is the same as a loiku or a military kabar or actually most hunting knives. Uh, there is a trend, of course, for much uh, thicker blades, uh, predominantly used with, with chopping applications. But um, as we're going to find out, that's not originally what this knife was intended for. So this knife was originally designed on the basis of a profile called a frontier knife. Uh, when you look at Dave Canterbury's site, that's exactly also what, how he describes it. When you think about how the frontier uh, men actually used their blades, they did not have a one blade fits all knife. What they did was they had a saw, an axe, a folding knife for whittling, and then a general purpose camp knife or sheath knife uh, which actually was predominantly used um, for chores such as uh, opening sacks of grain, cutting rope, uh, quickly uh, butchering uh, game on the trap line where they're in a hurry, uh, skinning, and, and general things like this. It's actually very unusual for the guys in those times to use these knives for woodworking types of activities and in fact um, most of the knives that were generated in that period uh, of this shape were really upgraded kitchen knives. So let's actually look a little bit about uh, blade geometry and see what the shape of this blade tells us about what it was originally made for. And we'll do that in that we will compare the knife to some other knives that we know. So let's look at the design of this knife in comparison with some other uh, classic shapes that we know. Up here we have two general purpose knives. Um, one is a Sami Loiku, a large um, chopping and general purpose knife used by the Sami, also for um, butchering large game like reindeer. It has the typical long straight slicing edge, the uplifted uh, tip, and then pretty much a straight line to the hand, fairly large grip with a, a widening at the edge to slop your, stop your hand from slipping out on the back. Another, ver another variety of uh, sort of one-use tool here, the military kabar, again it's this long straight slicing edge, the straight blade with the stopper on the end. And those two, that characteristic of this long straight uh, edge you do find in the Pathfinder knife. Looking a lot more like the Pathfinder is this Winchester hunting knife that I have. So here we will see it's a much more curved design. It also has a curved handle, a bit less of a length of uh, flat slicing area, and this uplifted tip. Then we have the three classic uh, kitchen knife shapes. So the butcher knife, uh, a slicing straight knife, and a boning knife. And again, we see that here this blade has some of the characteristics of each. So we have it's quite a wide blade, similar to the butcher knife. It has this upturned edge here, which is but not as pronounced as the butcher knife, 
So it's good for working in around bones and getting the meat off of uh, the game that you're preparing. And it has this dropped tip, similar to the hunting knife, which allows you to uh, put your finger here inside of the, uh, when you're working inside a carcass, um, and guide the blade, this is blunt here, and guide the blade to prevent you from piercing the intestines. What's noteworthy is that these two blades are actually designed to be used on wood. All the rest of these blades are not. The frontier knife design, this blade, which is also sometimes known as a French profile, was never actually intended to be used to process wood with. Uh, in the frontier days, these guys would have had saws and axes to process wood, and they had a fine folding knife for doing whittling. What these blades were made for was kitchen work, general chores in camp, and the rough skinning and gutting and processing of game um, in the field. We're going to have a look now a little bit about the balance of the blade, um, and that will tell you a little bit more about how that actually works in practice and what it tells us about what the blade is actually meant to do. So what about this balance thing? Well, let's look at this uh, loiku here, the purpose of this blade very much, chopping, processing wood, and processing large game. When I hold this blade in my hand in the way that I usually would, if I let go, it's going to fall with its tip forward. It wants to move downwards towards the ground. If I look now at the, the kabar, the kabar is actually balanced just behind the blade, just behind the guard. If I move my finger ever so slightly forward, it wants to come back. If I move my finger ever so slightly backwards, it'll come forward. So it is actually able to move in both directions, which is of course necessary as a fighting knife. Now if I look at the Winchester hunting knife here, when I put my hand where it's supposed to be, that blade falls backwards. I put my hand inside of here, as soon as I let go, it wants to fall backwards. And that's a characteristic of a hunting blade, because you're wanting to move very quickly inside the uh, creature that you are uh, processing. It wants to go to the back. All right. And if we now look at the, the Pathfinder blade, it wants to do the same thing. It wants to come back in my hand. Its balance point is actually a good piece behind where the blade meets the knife. So this tells us a lot about how it was originally meant to be used. This is a blade that's all about dexterity, where you can be inside the, the carcass. It's not as dexterous as the pure hunting knife. There is a little bit more weight to the front but that tells us a lot about how it's actually meant to be used. Similarly, the fact that this blade curvature is in place. Clearly it's more pronounced with the hunting knife, but here you have this, this blade curvature. So what have we learned about the knife design so far? When we look at the blade shape and also how the knife is balanced, it falls somewhere between the classic northern loiku, or multi-purpose woodsman's knife used by the Sami, a uh, classic shape hunting blade and the different profiles of a uh, kitchen knife. Um, and in fact, that makes a lot of sense because as we said before, this blade was uh, designed on the basis of the French, Frenchy or French profile trade knife used in frontier times for doing just that. Rough processing of game, general camp chores, um, and uh, the potentially also for use in terms of self-defense. Uh, after all, there were Indian wars going on and such like, and this would be the fixed blade that would be carried in the sheath. So let's actually get down to some testing and see how the blade performs. So in order to understand what we can actually expect from this blade, let's talk just a little bit about the steel that it's made of. So the Pathfinder uh, Scout is made of O1 tool steel. It's an oil hardened steel. It tends to have a Rockwell hardness somewhere between 57 and 59. Uh, the K bar that we looked at previously, about 56 to 58. The Loiku, a little bit softer, 54 to 56. 
Um, the hardness will tell you something about uh, whether the edge is tending, going to tend to chip or to roll, and uh, something also about uh, how it is to, to sharpen it. But O1 tool steel, essentially this is called a cold work steel. Uh, in the tool making industry it's largely used for tools that don't move very fast, um, hand tools and, uh, and uh, tools that are exposed to loads, suddenly changes in temperature and shocks. So it's um, a very hard wearing steel, it's very very easy to sharpen it in the field. And the inclusion of a relatively high amount of carbon, so in this case about 0.9%, together with a few interesting alloys, vanadium, tungsten, and so on, um, ensures that the steel has a, a matrix of very, very fine and finely distributed carbides. And what carbides are essentially is that they are crystals that form in the steel. Um, sometimes these crystals are, are larger and more irregularly dispersed uh, along the steel. Sometimes they are more finely, the, the crystals are smaller and more finely dispersed. The advantage with the finely dispersed crystals um, that are smaller is that uh, they are certainly easier to sharpen. Also the overall blade toughness is much higher in that the carbides, these chips, will tend not to chip out of the blade. Paradoxically, actually, sometimes um, the, a, a, a blade with steel that's made with, with greater, larger carbides can feel like it's sharper because the carbide crystals in the edge of the blade will act as mini serrations, so it's like a saw. But you could see that the danger would be if you um, expose this kind of crystal here, this cementite crystal, um, to a lot of side pressures that it would simply chip out. Whereas on a blade where the carbides are much finer and are uh, more finely distributed, um, this is much less of a problem. The blade will more likely end up rolling and also can be sharpened more easily. You can imagine that when you have these very, very hard crystals, they will um, resist the sharpening effects of the uh, whetstone or whatever else you're using. Um, generally just harder to work with. So. The O1 tool steel, cold work steel, um, pretty wear resistant, pretty tough, and uh, particularly quite abrasion resistant uh, due to the tungsten content. So knowing all that, let's put this thing to the test and see what it will actually do. So as you can see, just like with the uh, hunting knife here, the tip shape is perfectly adequate for getting into the uh, spaces that are prevalent on in the bones and the uh, cavities of most uh, large game to medium game. This is uh, here a vertebrae from a, a red deer locally. This is completely fine for, for getting into those kind of spaces and again you can use your finger when skinning and when getting inside of the, uh, the cavity to prevent the tip here from uh, doing damage and nicking the organs. So we already know from comparing the, the two tips here and the shapes that um, big game processing, meat processing, and getting inside of the cavity will be fine. Uh, since I don't have a large animal today that needs uh, garlicking or field processing or skinning, um, we're just going to have a look at the, the shape of the blades and, uh, and the comparison with how that uh, blade could go into the bones and say, that's good. So now let's have a look at it uh, for use in the kitchen. Sharpening the uh, Pathfinder, uh, for all of these tests, I sharpened this blade with three uh, finishing stones, a 320, a 600, and an 800 finishing stone wet. I'm going to start our tests uh, with our uh, uh, kitchen tester, cut some tomatoes up, and then uh, afterwards we'll come back to that and see how it did in terms of uh, keeping its edge and uh, its ability to make those lovely thin slices that we love so much. So let's have it, see how it does on a tomato, first of all. Okay, so I am not a kitchen maestro, but I do know how it feels to cut a tomato really fine. So we'll do this with this blade. It's able to shave Very, very thin pieces here. 
We'll see if it's still able to do that when I've cut some cardboard with it. Alright, I'm sure that all of you high-end chefs here will be absolutely freaking out at my horrible tomato cutting technique, but this is not about my fingers. This is about the blade. Alright, the, bla the tomato is definitely not getting mushed. And it's actually quite a pleasure to work with it. This is partly due to the, uh, the fact that the blade doesn't want to tip forward all the time. It's, it's staying nice and far back and it's not trying to brutalize these tomatoes. That one was particularly nice. Okay, so the tomato test here. Nice hand feel, easy to control. This is a very small tomato and we're getting some very nice uniform shapes and some very um, clean cut non-raggedy edges on this tomato. Okay. So let's use this blade to cut up some cardboard with. It's, cardboard is pretty unpleasant stuff to work with. Uh, it's super abrasive and it um, tends to want to tear more than cut. This uh, blade seems to have obviously no problem with that. Um, wouldn't expect it to. But the you know, you can cut cardboard with a kitchen knife. The purpose of this really is more to see how well the edge uh, withstands abrasion. So I'll go ahead and cut up uh, quite a bit of cardboard here, and then we'll go back to the tomatoes and see how it did. So despite the fact that this blade's actually not designed for battening and chopping logs and processing and so on, uh, let's see what it does anyway. This is a two-year-old seasoned beech from my wood pile here, and I'm going to use um, just the standard of issue uh, battening technique and see what this does. I can tell you right away that I do get some shock loading into my hand, but it's getting through. This is not easy wood to split, but it will do it. As you can see, that is some pretty hard wood to work with. Just in comparison though, I'll go and get my Loiko. Similar uh, piece of beech, um, also hardened and uh, seasoned for a couple of years now. I use the same stick beater. So there, you see it's considerably faster. The reason for that is essentially in the blade geometry. A large part of the effect that you require for battening is actually a wedging effect. And here you can see the difference very much in these two blades. In this blade you have, uh, the, the Loiku has a very flat grind here and then it makes a transition, a really noticeably feelable transition from this part of the blade so it narrows down into a taper here. Here the taper is much more gradual and it starts much closer to the spine of the blade. So you get a, a splitting and exploding effect from the Loiku that you just don't have uh, from the saber grind that the uh, Pathfinder blade comes from with. Uh, the other thing is, of course, that the, uh, the, the, the handle and the blade geometry are just quite different in terms of the balance. But the predominant aspect here is just this very uh, sudden change in angle that causes a splitting effect versus this more gradual change. So it does OK. Um, it's clearly not specialized to that, but it does work. So in terms of uh, uh, using the blade to uh, process down or, or perhaps even fell the kind of small trees uh, that you might use for construction work here, obviously this is not a, a chopping blade, uh, it just doesn't work like that, but you can obviously, you can very uh, effectively use it to make your 
V notches. I mean, it's, again, this is seasoned beach. It's hardwood. It does just fine. Again, I'm feeling some of the shock in my hand here. Uh, the, blit, the, the handle is also a little bit big for my hand and it feels kind of unwieldy. Um, but that's just probably a matter of what my hand size is uh, rather than anything that's specific to the blade. So again, comparing with the, uh, the Loiku, which is a, wood, a blade that's more uh, actually meant for that kind of work. You can already hear in the sound that this blade is making that we're in a different sort of a, an effect here. It's this wedging, it's knocking the pieces out a little bit more easily, but essentially it's all right. Um, I would say that the effort here is, is less, uh, but in the end this is not really how you want to be cutting wood. To me the um, the Pathfinder does just fine, uh, given that it's not really made for that kind of stuff. So let's go on to the next thing, uh, just whittling and carving, and then we'll go back in the kitchen. So for uh, general um, making of tent stakes and things like this, to me, um, the, the, the shape of the blade and how it's held is a little bit uncomfortable for this kind of work. Uh, this will tend to make a hot spot in my hand after a little while, but, you know, those are right. You can do all the necessary things with it. I mean, you absolutely can process your wood like this. It, it is not a problem at all. Um, for me, the Loiku has a, a more comfortable grip, and it, it grabs the uh, the wood a little bit better, but that probably has a lot to do with just that I'm used to using the Loiku and that that's my preferred style. Perfectly fine for this kind of work, though somehow not as ergonomic and not as easy in the hand. Let's take this thing back in the kitchen and uh, see how it does on the tomatoes after. So, back to the tomatoes. Let's see what happens. And I don't pretend this is any kind of scientific test, but more just a feeling how it feels to me. So we did uh, probably about 10 meters of cardboard, that battening, the chopping, a bit of uh, tent steak whittling, and I would expect that to have had very little effect on the tomato cutting. Yeah, it does. Yeah, a little bit of a little bit of bluntness appearing. It's actually quite normal with a uh a blade so you can see that we're getting a little bit of dent here in the tomato before we are able to cut it. Let me just get a fresh one. Let's see, I'm just gonna rest the blade on the tomato and slide it. Alright, now on the part where we heavily used it, yeah, it's okay, it's just, it's hanging a little bit, so let's see if I can get those really fine cuts that we had earlier, uh, not quite, okay, well, let's see how it does with a bit of field, a uh, little bit of sharpening, uh, I'm just going to use a field sharpening device, not my whetstones. I'll use a uh, what, one uh, field sharpening device that most of us have. Just one moment. So, Fjallkniven DC4. Um, just let's give it a few goes with that. Just I like to use it wet. So, I'm going to wet that just a bit. Sacrificial tomatoes here. 
and see how we go. Yep, now we're into happy tomato land again. So it doesn't take much. There's no squishing or bruising. The knife was very quickly back into its uh, super sharp state that we got it into with my um, sharpening stones earlier on. So what do we say about the uh, the Pathfinder Scout knife? Well, it's a great design somewhere between a, a general purpose uh, traditional uh, Scandinavian woodsman's knife and a hunting knife. It has many of the, the traits and functions of a hunting knife, but uh, clearly much more general purpose, perfectly adequate uh, for the wood uh, processing chores that many people will use it for. Um, the steel is correct. Things that disturb me a little bit about it, uh, the handle shape does not suit me at all. Um, I use my knives a lot when it's very very cold and uh, I need these blades not to slip out of my hand. It's uh, a little bit narrow and, uh, and that curved geometry um, to me and for my hand uh, transmits too much shock when I'm when I'm processing wood. Having said that, it's quite a bit shorter. Um, takes an edge very very well, easily field sharpenable. The tool is correct. This handle is fully sealed, so you really can use it for for hunting purposes. It's got the drop tip characteristic of the hunt knife, so you can guide uh, inside the uh, carcass when you're you're processing game. I think it's a great. Uh, all-around knife. Uh, it's not going to um, replace any of the ones that I have at the moment because uh, I essentially have the knife set that suits me. But yeah, absolutely fine. D is it worth the money? Not for me to judge. Um, those that have it tend to love it. Um, the the balance point uh, being a bit further uh, back is not great for how I like to use knives, but some people will really enjoy the the, the nimbleness and the dexterity that that gives I guess, uh, as with all things, it depends on what you're going to use it for. Um, so if you want a general purpose sheath knife and your uh, predominant uh, functions are going to be slicing, boning, skinning, um, paring even, and, uh, and, and uh, large uh, butchering jobs, and things like cutting rope and cardboard and canvas and things like this, and you want to be able to uh, sharpen this thing easily in the field, then it's going to be a great knife for you.